Okay. And... All right, let's go ahead and open up in prayer. And we will pray for our technical issues. <laughs> Our Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful, beautiful day that we can serve you. We've, you have given us life. You've given us breath today. <clears throat> and the purpose is to serve you and to give you glory. And we thank you for that, Lord. And we do pray for any technical issues that we have, Lord, that you will help us uh, give us wisdom in knowing how to, to work it. And we thank you for it. We thank you for the technology to for all of us to get together and study your word um, and glorify you in what we learn tonight and I just pray that we will be honoring to you in what we read tonight about you and about Daniel and that we will um, apply it to and give you glory in Jesus name amen amen okay. I have a song for y'all <laughs> Let me let me know if you can hear it pretty good. I'm gonna turn it up pretty loud. So let me know. Can you hear it? No. 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 Are you messing with? Me? <laughs> oh, here we go. First, your pretty balloon. I'm taking the moon. Is it Sinatra? It's time to wind it up. Somebody like that. <laughs> oh, shoot. I forgot to talk. Oh, Just make your mind up. Could y'all hear that song? Not all bit. of the words. Okay, I'm going to tell you what the word is. I know you know the song. It's by Bobby Darren. It's The Party's Over. Uh, oh, okay. It's The Party's Over. <clears throat> it's time to call <clears throat> in the day. They've burst your pretty balloons and taken the moon away. It's time to wind up the masquerade. Just make up your mind. The piper must be paid. That's our theme song for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Darren did not know he's singing about Daniel 5. He didn't know. <laughs> but that is Daniel 5. The piper must be paid. The party's over. That's our that's our chapter in the Bible study. <laughs> I'm writing that in my book. <laughs> right. Write it in the your name. Over. The party's over. Time to call it a day. Okay, so Daniel 5 is interesting, very interesting. Um, Daniel 5 is a source of a lot of popular sayings that we have today, like, well, the handwriting's on the wall, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, how about your days are numbered? Yep. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. How about what? his knees were knocking? He was, <laughs> he was <laughs> so scared, yeah. So this is where we get these from Daniel 5. Um, so I gave you guys an outline of Daniel 5, which I thought was kind of cute. It was the ball, the gall, the wall, the call, <laughs> and the ball. That was great. That was great, too. That was, I thought that was kind of pretty cute. Yeah. So we're going to start with the ball. Okay. Um. So Daniel 1, 5, 1 says later, we'll stop right there. <laughs> okay, later. When is this later? Okay, so um, the end of the 70 years captivity, I gave you guys the, the date is 536. That's going to be in about three years from now. Okay, the end of the 70 years. Darius the Mede captures Babylon in 539. So you can write that in your Bible next to Daniel chapter one, uh, chapter five, verse one. That later is 539. Now, I wanted to give you a little history, too, of the if you get your rulers and prophets chart out of Daniel's time. Mm -hmm. um, they put three little lines there of three, three kings of the uh, 
Babylonian Empire, after Nebuchadnezzar, there was three kings, and then there was um, Belshazzar. And I just want to talk about those just briefly, not that it really matters, but <laughs> he, they are part of Nebuchadnezzar's um, successors. So um, we first see after Nebuchadnezzar in 562 uh, to 560, for two years. He was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. He reigned two years and he was murdered. Uh, Babylonian sources say that after his reign, they describe him, they describe him as incompetent. So there was a coup that murdered him. He was overthrown and murdered by his brother-in-law, which was the next king, Nereglesiar. Nereglesiar. He was his brother-in-law. Um, who became king. And he, Nereglesiar, ruled for four years. And he was one of the prominent generals of Nebuchadnezzar, and Nereglesiar married one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters. And that's how he became king. So it doesn't matter who you marry. <laughs> okay. Now, this could be the same queen, Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, that is talked about in chapter five. We don't know. But it could be. Um. So Nereglazer, Nere he dies in 556, and he was succeeded by his son, Labeshai Marduk, who reigned only for about two or three months. And he was deposed and killed. And it's, um, history says that Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, led a coup against the king, deposing and killing Labeshai Marduk and proclaiming his father, Nebuchadnezzar, as king. And we don't know why he, he um, apparently he was incompetent too. <laughs> so he only ruled for a couple of months. But um, so Nebuchadnezzar became king. Okay, now some people say, because they want to discredit God's word, is that there is an error in the Bible because the last king of Babylon was Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel says Belshazzar was the last king. Well, both can be true. We, um, I gave you a link for the cylinder. There was a clay cylinder that was found in 1854. It was a long article. You didn't have to read the whole thing. But it did say that Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon, and he had a son, Belshazzar. Mm -hmm. And it also describes some of the conquering of the Persians in that cylinder. And that cylinder is on display in the British Museum today. Um, so Daniel also substantiates the fact that Belshazzar was co-regent with his father, Nabonidus, by offering Daniel, later we're going to see, he offers him third ruler in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't offer him the second because Belshazzar was second. The first was Nabonidus, his father. So that shows that there was a co-regency between the son and, and the father of the king there. Okay, so once again, we see the truth of God's word is vindicated through history. Um, as if God needed anyone to vindicate him. But the Bible is correct, regardless of whether ruins or artifacts um, show it or not. It's, um, it's not that the Bible... That archaeology proves the Bible, the Bible proves that archaeology is correct. Okay. So sometimes they do dig up stuff that they're like, oh yeah, that's what the Bible says. Well, we could have told them that, right? So um this event actually, the, the later there is actually probably about 20 years after chapter four, after Nebuchadnezzar become uh becomes a beast for seven years. It's probably about 20 years later because we also see that King Belshazzar does not even, he appears to not even know who Daniel is personally. So it, quite a bit of time has passed from chapter two, four to chapter five. Um, now it says, verse one, later, King Belshazzar had a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. And that was not uncommon for kings to have parties for thousands. I can't imagine giving a party for a thousand. Can you, Sherry? 
No. <laughs> Two fifty is enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give party for thousands of people. Um and then verse two. Under the influence of the wine, Belshazzar gave orders to bring in the gold and silver vessels that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken in the temple in Jerusalem so the king could drink from them along with the nobles, his wives, and his concubines. Okay, so um, just to give you a setting of what's going on here, it's not just a party. There's a lot going on outside the party. Okay. Um, According to historical accounts, the Medio Persian army led by Darius. Now, Darius is, they say, is either, either a king of the Medes or it was another name for Cyrus, which we're going to see Cyrus next. <laughs> but some believe also that Cyrus and Darius co ruled together. Darius was the Medes, Cyrus was the Persians. And so, either way, um, the Bible says it was Darius in chapter five. Um, Darius had undertaken a siege against Babylon and some sources report that it had been in effect for four months. Belshazzar knew that this army was outside his city gates for the last four months. Um, but he thought nobody could touch him. So he was going to party. He knows there's an army outside. He's going to party thinking that he's invincible. And nothing's going to happen to him. Um, Babylon is reported to have enough grain to feed their city for 20 years. And the Euphrates River was there that ran through the city. That was a reliable water source. So they had this false security. Just like many unbelievers. You know there's a doom coming, but you just would rather party. <laughs> right? Okay. So, so uh, Proverbs 18.11. Belshazzar was like this man. A rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his own imagination. Hmm. Rich men, sometimes rich people imagine their wealth is their strong defense. And, will, and, and that's their security from any storm of life that's going to come. And they <laughs> only protection and their protection is really only in their imagination. Because actually only God is a sure refuge. So life is fragile. But the pagan mindset says, let's eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die. Right? So, mm -hmm. um, but for Belshazzar, there wasn't going to be a tomorrow. So this also reminds us of Matthew 24. Um, I don't have that scripture in in I didn't give that to Daniel but it, it's just describing the son of the coming of the son of man it says for in the days that were before the flood it for as in the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day of Noah entered the ark they they were acting that way before the flood they're mm -hmm. going to act lost people will act that way before the son of man comes it's what lots of people do. They don't think that there is going to come a day of reckoning. Mm -hmm. But there will be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, verse 2 and 3. Belshazzar gets the gold and silver vessels. Um, so the king could drink from them. That's an arrogance. That's an arrogance. Um, and... It does talk about the one of the versions I think talks about the holy vessels. I think does your Bible say a holy vessel? Somewhere I got the word holy. But anyway, these vessels were holy. They were holy. They were meant for the temple, for the tabernacle, and for the temple. And holy means set apart. When God says you should be holy as God is holy, it doesn't mean that you should be perfect, but you're to be set apart is what the word means. And um, it's kind of like, it means something that has been set apart for a special service. And these gold and silver vessels were set apart for the service of God. And that's what God intended those vessels to be used for. 
And when someone uses those vessels for something different than God intended, God gets very offended. It's kind of like um, when you consider our toothbrush is holy. We don't want somebody else using it, right? <laughs> okay. Have you ever seen that that bumper sticker that says, you touching my truck, I'm breaking your face? That <laughs> truck is meant just for that person, for that purpose. The truck is meant for the owner's use and nobody else's use. And God intends for us to be used for his purpose too. God was offended that they were using something that belonged to him to worship idols. God considers you holy. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be used for his purposes. Okay, verse um, four. As they drank the wine, they praised the, their gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. And we had talked about the Babylonian gods were all about gold. They built everything out of gold. They loved gold. That's why the statue in Daniel 2 is the head of the gold. It is gold. Um, but it's interesting that they praised their gods of gold, silver, bronze, and iron, wood, and stone. That reminds me of Revelation 9. The wording is much the same. In Revelation 9, Verse 20, 21, it says, now the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, this is the, this is the end of the tribulation, still did not repent of the works of their hand. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. They're doing it again, which cannot see, hear, or walk, which I love that. I love that. God says, they can't see you. Like God sees you. God can see you wherever you are. They can't hear you. They can't hear your prayers. They can't walk. They can't even get off the table you put them on. They can. They cannot be anywhere but where you put them. Furthermore, verse 21, they did not repent of their murder, sorcery, sexual immorality, and theft. It sounds so much like Daniel 5. They're worshiping these idols. And Revelation nine says these idols are demons and even paul says idols are demons there's somebody there's somebody's imagination and we worship people worship them it's unbelievable um but god was holding babylon more accountable here god was offended why was god offended why at this point why was god offended with belshazzar well, God was holding Babylon more accountable because one reason was that they were being used by God to punish Israel. And one day he was going to return Israel to their land, but he was using Babylon. Okay. Then God saves Babylon. I mean, uh, saves Nebuchadnezzar. He saves them after much um, that has been said by Daniel to them about the one true Jehovah God. So that country has more light than before. And God holds people accountable who have more light than those who don't. There are country, other countries that worship idols that God doesn't punish. He lets them just kind of waller in their, their sin, but he doesn't hold them accountable like he's holding King um, Belshazzar accountable. But once you've been introduced to the God of, of this world and then you reject him, God is offended, and there's going to be accountability there. God will not be mocked. Our country was founded on the Bible and its principles. God will hold this country more accountable than others. We just had this past weekend reminds us of how far our country has gone. Mm -hmm. Transgender Recognition Day on Easter. Yeah disgusting i'm Horrible. telling you god is offended god has created male and female to worship him and when people change what god has created them to be god is offended and our country is going to be held accountable for the light we have and our light is going out mm -hmm. yeah so belshazzar thought this great city of babylon was impregnable Pregnable. Um, and from a humanistic view, it sounds like he's 
he could be very uh, secure. I think on the handout, I gave you a description of the Babylonian city. City, mm -hmm. it sounds really secure. Mm -hmm. Sounds really secure. Um, two sets of walls, 25 feet thick. 25 feet, that's bigger than this room. That's how big this wall, these two sets of walls were. And then um, high as some, some of them were as high as 350 feet. That's taller than a football field. Mm -hmm. And the walls were thick enough that four chariots could go across it. And then just inside the outer walls was a moat. And inside the moat was another system of inner walls. I mean, the description of Babylon was like, nobody's going to get through that. Nobody's going to crawl over that wall. Nobody's going to uh, break down that wall. But somebody might go under it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see that your city is um, indestructible. Swam through the river, didn't Yeah. Underneath the so Balthazar is a perfect picture of men and women in the last days. They just think before, um, before God's wrath falls on them, 1 Thessalonians 5.3, Paul writes this. While they were saying peace and safety, then destruction, destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. The tribulation is going to begin with peace. The Antichrist is going to bring peace, and he's going to say peace and safety. But then suddenly there's going to be a, a destruction. And this that's, this is what's going to happen to Belshazzar. Okay, let's look. Uh, any questions or comments? So, one through four. <clears throat> okay. All right, verse five. At that moment, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. As the king watched the hand that was writing, his face grew pale and his thoughts were so alarmed that his hips gave way and his knees knocked together. Um, some say that it says near the lampstand in the royal palace. That very well could be the lampstand that was taken out of the temple. And, he, and God had the writing near a light so that everybody could see it in the room. Um, so they saw it. This this reminds me of John 8. I love John 8. John 8, 5 through 8. It says, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What would you say? This is the Pharisees bringing an adulterous woman to them and say, the law says you're supposed to stone them. But they were testing Jesus because the Roman law said they could not stone this woman who was found in adultery. Okay, so they're testing Jesus. What are we going to do now? The law says we got to stone her. What do you say? And verse six says, and they said this to test him in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. And when they continued to question him, he straightened up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her. And again, he bit, bent down and wrote on the ground. I do wonder what he wrote on the ground. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say, but it is the finger of God. It's the finger of God writing a message on the ground. And they had whatever they saw him write, they left. So it must have been something. So, but here God is writing on a wall. He's writing on a wall. Okay, verse 7, the king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought in. And he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this inscription and tells me its interpretation will be clothed in purple, have a gold chain placed around his neck, and will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. <clears throat> so here we see for the third time. A king has a problem and he goes to the wrong source. Have you ever heard three strikes are out? Mm -hmm. This repeats itself for the third time here in Daniel. Three times they call for their wise men to help them. Um, but they can't. Um, 
So verse eight says, so all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or interpret it for him. Then King Belshazzar became even more terrified. His, um, his face grew even more pale and his nobles were bewildered. They couldn't tell him what it meant. Verse 10, here in the outcry of the king and his nobles, the queen entered the banquet hall. O king, may you live forever. And she said, do not let your thoughts terrify you or your face grow pale. So here we have um, the queen. It's most likely it could be his mother or it could be his grandmother. But um, anyway, it, it was probably someone who was old enough to remember Daniel. Okay. Um, she was also wise enough probably not to be at the party. So, um, but she was, she knew, she knew Daniel or knew of Daniel because um, she knew the situation and that this has happened before and Daniel can do it. So she says, don't let your thoughts terrify you. In fact, she's saying, in essence, she's saying, pull yourself together. <laughs> pull yourself together. Um, settle down. Calm down. But she says, um, verse 11, there is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the days of your father, he was found to be to have insight, intelligence, and wisdom like that of the gods. And the word in the days of your father can also, the Bible also talk talks about a father as being a grandfather or even a great grandfather. Um, so it may not be his actual father, but this queen knew of Daniel that there is, and apparently she knew he's still in the kingdom. He's in the kingdom and he is found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom. That is describing Daniel. It reminds me of Ezekiel 2. Ezekiel 2, verse 4 and 5. I am sending to you, I'm sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children. And you say to them, thus says the Lord God, as for them, whether they listen or not, they are a rebellious house, but they will know that a prophet has been among them. Ezekiel said, I'm sending a prophet and you're going to speak the word. And they may not, they may not turn, they may not under, or decide to do what you say, but they will know that this prophet was among them, that a God's man was among them. So Daniel was known as God's man. And so they may not listen to Daniel, but they knew a prophet was among them. And so keep in mind that Daniel was probably about 80 years old here, but he's still running the race with endurance. And then the king says, um, Well, the last half of um, verse 11, your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of magicians, encount enchanters, astrologers and diviners. Your own your own father, the king, did this because Daniel, the one he named Belshazzar, Belteshazzar, was found to have an extraordinary spirit as spirit, as well as knowledge, understanding and ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles and solve difficult problems. Summon Daniel. Therefore, he will give you the interpretation. Okay. So she's explaining to him that your ancestors knew Daniel. They relied on him. They made him chief magi magician, which Daniel probably wasn't in that high office at this point, either because of his age or nobody cared about what Daniel had to say. So they probably dropped him. So he probably wasn't a high official at this point any longer. But this queen knew of him and knew his abilities. Verse 13, so Daniel was brought before the king who asked him, are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? So right off the bat, Belshazzar kind of... Um, has a condescending attitude toward Daniel. He says, are you Daniel, one of the exiles? He didn't say, are you Daniel, one of the chief, the chief of the wise men that my father appointed you as? No, he says, you're one of the exiles. 
he kind of wanted to put Daniel in his place, reminding him of his roots. So, um, verse 16, but I have heard about you, that you were able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Well, of course he heard, he just now heard of him from the queen. Therefore, if you can read this inscription and give me its interpretation, you will be clothed in purple, have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made third highest ruler in the kingdom. Verse 17. In response, Daniel said to the king, keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to somebody else. Nevertheless, I will read the inscription for the king and interpret it for him. So Daniel's not interested in these rewards from a pagan king. His only desire is the eternal rewards from the king of kings. He had no desire for material gain. Um, he just wanted to tell the truth about God and what God was doing. And, you know, a lesser man could have been bought off by a huge reward. They could, he could have, it would have been much easier to go along with the rest of the wise men and say, I don't know what it means. Um, and ignore the inscription, but because no one else knew what it meant. So he could have just went along with the crowd and said, I don't, I don't think I'm going to tell you because, um, or he could have left out part of it. He could have, he could have interpreted some of it, but not read the uh, pronouncement of doom and gloom. But Daniel was a picture of courage. He was going to tell the whole truth without fear. And you real remember that Belshazzar had thousands of, of lords and dignitaries at this party. These were people who were much higher in him in status. And so it had to take a brave person to speak against these, these people to give the whole counsel of God's word. Okay. Verse 18, as for you, O king, the most high God, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness, glory, and honor. So he starts off with, God gave your father what he had. Because of the greatness, verse 19, because of the greatness that he bestowed on him, the people of every nation and language trembled in fear before him. He killed whom he wished and kept alive whom he wished. He exalted whom he wished and humbled whom he wished. But when his heart became arrogant and his spirit was hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven away from mankind. His mind was like that of a beast. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the most high God rules over the kingdom of mankind, set it, setting it over whom he wishes. So Daniel reminds the king, of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And you know that Belshazzar knew all this. He they knew what he knew what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He probably doesn't realize that it was God who did it. But these kings, the Babylonian kings, any any of these kings, they kept very good records. And it was usually read by the by the next king because um it, it was their records of their of their nation of their country so so Daniel starts off with I want to you know the history of your father of Nebuchadnezzar verse 22 and the reason why he did it is because he didn't exalt God and the glory was taken from him so here that's this should be an example for you Belshazzar Verse 22, but you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. Daniel knew he knew it. Verse 23, instead, you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. The vessels from his house were brought to you, and as you drank wine from them with your nobles, wives, and concubines, you praised the gods of your of silver, gold, and bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. Mm -hmm. Again, like Revelation 9. But you have failed to glorify the God who holds his hand, 
who holds in his hand your very breath and all your ways. That is a good witnessing line. To tell people that God holds in his hand the very breath that you breathe. And you have failed to glorify God. It's very good to start with that God is the creator. Mm -hmm. Is God is your creator. Okay. So Daniel is emphasizing again on God's sovereignty over men and over nations, even the most powerful men on earth, um, whether they acknowledge it or not. It is, it is God has given them the gift of being the king over their country and whether they acknowledge it or not. Um, I see. Now, we saw in the book of Kings, even still, you see here where you think, well, Belshazzar should have known what happened in Nebuchadnezzar and should have kept... His father should have told him and, and he should know. But when we studied the book of Kings, we saw that um, a good king, the next king would be his son, would be a bad king. Mm -hmm. Just because you have the truth and you tell your family the truth doesn't mean that everyone in your family is going to be saved. It's not doesn't mean that they're all going to follow the truth. We've even seen bad kings who had sons that turned out to be good kings so we can't rely on our family to get us to heaven but we can learn from them whether they're good or bad god uses history to show the right and wrong way to live a life the more light you're given the more god holds you responsible um hebrews 10:29 <clears throat> Not there. Not there. Is it not there? I don't see it. Oh, nine twenty-seven. Seven. Okay. Well, twenty-nine. I might not have given it to her. Um, it's it says that how much severe punishment do you think he will deserve? who has trampled under the foot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace. He's saying that there's going to be a more severe punishment for those who trample underfoot the Son of God and regard him as unclean or regard him as not being God or he's just a man or just a teacher but there's going to be a more severe punishment for those who know the truth and reject the truth. Okay. Okay. So Daniel, uh, let's look at verse 23. He gives um, three charges against uh, Belshazzar. Or actually he talks about three charges against Nebuchadnezzar. I think. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Belshazzar. Three charges against Belshazzar. First, he said he had not humbled his heart, even though he knew about God and his good works through the life of Nebuchadnezzar. That's one charge. You knew about what God did. The second thing he says, he deliberately mocked God by desecrating God's holy vessels. You took the vessels, you drank from them, and you deliberately mocked God. This is defiance, not ignorance. It's defiance. Okay. And then the third charge was that he worshiped idols. So Bel Belshazzar imagined that he's the master of his own fate. He's the captain of his own ship and of his own soul. But in the God whose hand are your life breath and your ways you have not glorified. Okay. So here we have the inscription. Any questions or comments so far? Okay, verse 25. Now, this is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tikel, 
far sin, or it, your Bible may say you, you far sin. Okay. And verse 26, this is the interpretation of the message. Mene means that God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel means that you have been weighed and on the scales and found deficient. Fairies or you fairies, you farson, means that your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. So Mene, and he says it twice for emphasis. God has Belshazzar's number. God has <laughs> your number. And it fell short. And then Tico, God weighed Belshazzar and he came up light. God had weighed Belshazzar's life in the scales of justice and found that he came up short. His life didn't measure up to God's standards of righteousness. The Egyptian book of the dead pictures men weighed in uh, being weighed in balances. You'll see them in the in the tombs of the kings and you'll see someone holding the scale. And they believe that you, um, your sins either outweighed your worthy deeds or your worthy deeds outweighed your sins. So that was the picture that the Egyptians would put on the tombs. But scripture makes it clear that salvation is not determined um, that way because Romans 3.23 says none of us are worthy. Right. There's none worthy. <clears throat> We've all come sin and come short of the glory of God. We have been weighed and we come up short. We come up short. What we have on the good side of the scales for us is the righteousness of Christ. It has nothing to do. Our, our works are as filthy rags. But that's on the that's on the bad side. But on the good side. That outweighs that is the righteousness of Christ. And it's not about works. And there are so many times people say, well, I just hope God um, sees that I've done more good things than I've done bad. And that's not how salvation works. It's, um, it's not a works religion. There's only two religions in the world. One is works and one is faith in God's righteousness. And we can't get to heaven through works. Right. Yeah. Right. So he's been weighed and found short. Okay. And then God would therefore divide Belshazzar's kingdom to the Medes and the Persians. The you, if your version has a you in front of the Farsan, uh, the you means and. You've been weighed and your kingdom's going to be divided between the Medes and the Persians. And it's interesting that he says, uh, verse 28, he says, it means that your kingdom has been divided. That's past tense. It's not will be. He didn't say it will be divided. It's past tense as if it has already happened. And it probably already, they were probably already in the gates by this time. At this very moment, it's likely that the Euphrates River had been diverted to provide access under this mammoth wall. Um, the ancient Greek historian Herodotus relates that Darius conquered Babylon by diverting the flow of the Euphrates into a nearby swamp. This lowered the level of the river so that his troops marched through the water and under the river gates. Okay, so... No matter how high your wall is, if God wants something done, God will find a way. <laughs> and so they went actually went under these enormous walls. Yeah. Now, this prophecy was prophesied <clears throat> 200 years before in Isaiah, Isaiah 13. The, uh, the Medes coming in. Isaiah 13, 17 through 19 says, Behold, I will stir up against them, he's talking about Babylon, the Medes, who have no regard for silver and no desire for gold. And remember that Babylonians were all about gold. And then, of course, in the statue, they, the, um, the Medes and Persians were represented as the silver. 
but they have no desire for gold. Their bows will dash young men to pieces. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. They will not look on pity on the children. And Babylon, the jewel of the kingdoms, the glory of the pride of the Chaldeans will be overthrown by God, like Sodom and Gomorrah. That was prophesied 200 years before. Now, also, um, let's read Jeremiah 51, 11. There's several prophecies about Babylon, but just, just to pick a couple of them. Uh, sharpen the arrows, fill the quivers. The Lord has aroused the spirit of the kings of the Medes because his plan is aimed at Babylon to destroy her. This was God's plan. That the Medes and the Persians overtake Babylon. And this was prophesied way before Daniel. And there are, there are people, I think we had talked about, some people think that Daniel was written in about 60 AD after all this thing, this happened. So he wasn't really a prophet. He was just recording what history did. Well, what, what about Isaiah and Jeremiah? They prophesied the destruction of Babylon. You can't pick out just Daniel. You'll have to say Jeremiah and um, Isaiah were written later, but they weren't. They were written hundreds of years before this happened. This was prophecy. And that's how we know the Bible is true is because prophecy has been fulfilled. Has been fulfilled and it will still be fulfilled just the way it has been literally fulfilled in the past. So in, in October of 539 BC, Babylon falls. Okay, then uh, let's read verse 29. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel in purple, placed a gold chain around his neck and proclaimed him to be the highest ruler in the kingdom. Here, <clears throat> you know, it, it's sad that it doesn't read that Belshazzar repented. It just, he kind of just ignored what Daniel said and just said, oh, and here, by the way, you're third in the kingdom. Here's purple and gold chain and um, probably the shortest lived third ruler in, of course, the history of Babylon, for sure. Um, his his uh, third in command probably lasted anywhere from five minutes to two hours, probably. Just a couple, you know, within part of a day, he was third in the kingdom. Because it, it just looks like Belshazzar thinks he, he doesn't get it. He's still going to honor Daniel instead of saying, oh, no, we're going to be taken over by the Medes and Persians. The one, same Medes and Persians that are outside our city walls, they're going to get in. No, he just makes Daniel the third ruler in the kingdom and acts like the, his kingdom's just going to keep going. So verse 30 says that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom at the age of 62. <clears throat> so at some point, God has said, you've crossed the line. There, I found this. I'll read it. It says sinners like to believe that God will never punish them or if punishment is coming, it is so far off in the distant future that they have plenty of time to repent and be ready to meet the Lord. This is a dangerous and even a deadly attitude. Yeah. God is obligated to continually send his spirit and convict us of our sin. There's going to be a time when God, when you cross the line and the Holy Spirit is no longer going to work in that person's life, but no one knows when that time is going to come and no one knows but God when the line has been crossed. But much of this, we, but of this much, we may be sure. The opportunity to get right with God ends with death. And after we die, there's only judgment to come. Hebrews 6, uh, Hebrews 10, 26. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Hebrews 9, 27. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, sorry. Hebrews 9, 27. And just as it is appointed to die once, after that to face the judgment. It's 
there's two things going on in that verse. It's appointed for you to die. You can't add another day to your life. You can't say, wait, give me a few more minutes. Give me a few more years. God says it is appointed to die once. And then after that, you're going to face the judgment. There are people who say, well, I believe that after I die, God will give me another chance. Mm -hmm. Not according to the Bible. After you die, there's going to be a judgment to be faced. It's foolish to presume upon God's grace that He, God doesn't owe us anything. If we reject his offer of salvation, there remains no, oh, this is Hebrews 10, 26. There it is. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. So if if we presume upon the grace of God, he doesn't owe us anything. If we reject salvation, there is no other sacrifice. There is no other way to heaven except through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If we turn away from Jesus, if we put off trusting him, where else are you going to go to get your sins forgiven? Nowhere. There's no other sacrifice for sins. Those who take God's grace for, for granted will be eternally disappointed. So verse 31 says, And Darius the Mede received the kingdom at age 32. Now Darius was, a, like we said, either Darius was a sub or a, another title for Cyrus the Persian. Or they were called rulers. But um, here we see Darius. Next chapter, we're going to see Cyrus. But clearly, this person was ruler and he was a Mede. Okay, so there are a couple of things to sum up Chan Daniel chapter 5. Any questions on this chapter so far? That Well, we ended it, but I still have more to say. <laughs> Any questions or comments about Jan uh, Daniel 5? So I have a question. Okay. Is, at the end, when you said Darius the Mede could mm -hmm. be Cyrus or it could be two different people. Is that right? Yeah, there's two views there. There's two views. Okay. Either it's two different people. One was the ruler of the Medes. The Medes and the Persians were two countries and they came together to take over the Middle East and okay. Darius and and Darius took over Babylon and Cyrus was overall the whole thing. That's one view. The other view is that Cyrus was the king of both Medes and Persians, but Darius is just a name for another name for king. So oh. there's two views there. Okay. Thank you. Because the Old Testament has a lot to say about Cyrus. Um, it calls Cyrus by name. It's Daniel that says that there was Darius the Mede. So that's why sometimes they say either Cyrus was, that was another name. Darius was another name for Cyrus the king. Um, or they were two different people and Darius controlled a certain, he was a general that took over Babylon. Okay. Not sure, not sure which. Any anybody? Was there another question? That was okay. my question too. Thank oh, you. Okay. Thank you, Chrissy. Okay, so we're going to sum up chapter five in four points. Here they are. Babylon became great because the sovereignty because of the sovereign blessing of God. It says that over and over again that Babylon only became great because God made them great. The sovereignty of God made them great. Sounds a little like our country. God made our country great. Mm -hmm. yeah. God gets, should get the credit because it is God who, who got our country to where it is today. The other mm -hmm. point is that when they became great, their pride made them forget God. What Sounds like our country. Today, yeah. Yeah. We forget about God. First, the third point, when they forgot God, they begin to take him for granted mm -hmm. and start, start um, boasting themselves. 
Then the last point is when they took him for granted, God judged them and they were no longer a great nation. Mm -hmm. That could be our future. The warning to our country. Are we on the same path? Yes. I think so. So we, we can search through the rubble of history. We can see Babylon, the Media Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. We can see where where their their um their nations were just brought down to nothing. They were they were huge, big important people back in the history. In the last hundred years, we see communist empires, we see the, the Third Reich of Hitler. They've come and gone. But the tendencies of these great nations are the same. They tend to believe that they will always be the superpower. Yep. They're going to always be the superpower. And they slowly push God out of the picture. Yep. They take him out of public life. They forbid the mention of his name. They ridicule those who believe in him. They promote those who exalt man and play down God. They would like to rewrite the Bible, yep. the rule book. And they like to live by their own set of rules. Over time, we take God for granted. We turn our own, we turn to our own idols. Here in our country, we turn to idols of technology. We begin to worship wealth or the things that we've made. Look at the things that we've done. These are our idols. And in the God, in the end, God judges that nation, and is that nation will no longer be great. Yep. And note this, note this, that this is a biblical fact. Judgment often comes in the hands of another nation that God rises up for that purpose. Yep. And could that be our future? I don't want it to all sound like doom and gloom here, but I think this is, you know, if we don't, what is the saying? If we don't learn from history, we're, we're, doomed, doomed, to repeat repeat we're doomed to repeat it. That's right. We're doomed to repeat it. So we see here in Daniel 5, the passing of the baton from the golden head to the silver kingdom of the statue. The medieval Persians have come to pass just as God predicted it. The point here is that God's word is sure. And the party's over. <laughs> yeah, the party will be over. But we also see a lot of similarities of Babylon and how it is destroyed and how it will be um, again in the tribulation. We see some similarities there. Okay. Any other questions, comments, or complaints? Daniel's exciting. <laughs> it is exciting. It is. Yes. Yes. It is exciting. I love it. I love that, you know, <clears throat> God's word comes true. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we can see it. We are so blessed to be able to look back and see that what God said came true. Yes. We yes. are so blessed to have yes. that. Yes. And to have God's word that reminds us, tells us exactly what happened. It's just a wonderful um, time to be a Christian. But at the same time, <clears throat> very discouraging time to be a Christian because we see God is not all the time. Mm -hmm. And I hate that for our country. Mm -hmm. It's mocked by our leaders. And it's mocked by our leaders, my mom mm -hmm. says. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, remember to make your um, title of chapter five. Chapter five has to do with the hand writing on the wall. <laughs> okay. Now, um, next week, I cannot be here at Bible study. So we're going to take a week off next week. Um, I have to go to Jacksonville and help my son with a coffee show. Okay. It's a, it's a really big show and um, a really big show. 
really big shoe. Ed Sullivan. Yeah, Ed Sullivan. Yeah, a really big shoe. Really big shoe. And yeah, that same back station, same back channel. <laughs> same back channel. Is that what he said? Same yeah. bad time. Same bad time. Same bad channel. Same bad time. Same bad channel. Yeah, that's Batman. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Move on. Move on. Um. <laughs> But anyway, he, um, my two sons own a coffee business and they are doing